Was it open with the, the front door? Uh, yeah. So we didn't need to to go to a window because uh, that the Roland Roland keeps telling us that they used to walk. Okay, so let's wait for a couple of more minutes. So the postdoc came by, by himself. I thought probably it's where it's going to go. It's like I said. Yeah. So Mike is not planning to come? I don't think so. But I don't know. <laughs> So I don't know what to do. <laughs> So, all right, we are getting ready to get started here. And what I wanted to ask you, people online, so we know that our speaker has tendency to travel during the presentation, wander around the room. So if if the sound will be too too quiet, etc., please let us know. We will try to do our best to, to, to get back and the point. So all right, and now let's start our regular back seminar. So it's the end of March. And today we have Yves Mugliomi, so he's a senior research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, and he's a well-recognized, let me say that, specialist in uh, fault mechanics, and, and basically he's done a lot of work understanding the fault behavior in situ uh, from, from, you know, um, just just observations in the field, in situ observations, designing tools and uh, unique tools for these observations, and also doing modeling and designing experiments. So we will hear about that today. So before joining the, the Berkeley lab, Eve spent quite a bit of time working in academia in France. So he's one of the rare species who could be the tier in, in Europe. And go to the to the wild environments of of a national laboratory region states. So and today he will present the summary of his recent work, recent results that will have to do with three dimensional uh, fault monitoring and trying to interpret what we see in the field. So and if thank you so much, the other way. Thank you, Stas, and thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for coming. And thanks to the banks to invite me for this talk. Um, so, as um, I am talking, but as you see in, in the course, there are so many authors who contribute to this work. You will see them at the end, and some of them. Um, 
So it wants to go. Yeah. Does it move? Yeah, no. yeah, it works one way. Yeah. Um, so that's the only slide I found to illustrate a little the talk, um, which is um, that kind of classical, uh, classical graph where, where people try to do when they talk about it, you say specificity. I would say in a more or less complex uh, or more or less equivocal way, they always try to correlate uh, the field. Namely, for example, the ejected volume and um, the fall movement. That's one example. Uh, I think this one, of course, because I'm going to talk about how we measure sleep in the field or uh, how we can do this kind of correlation. But to see on this graph, um, I see maybe three patches of uh, uh, dots. Um, and um, the horizontal axis. Uh, sorry, before I continue, do you hear me from a remote when I am away from the microphone? I also ask them, so let's see. Okay. Yes. Because I yes. am sorry. <laughs> okay, maybe maybe if you can speak a little bit louder, but other, okay. otherwise people seem to be pretty happy. Okay. So on the horizontal axis, you have uh, the injective volume and um, in the wall, and the vertical axis, as you see, is the fall sleep velocity. And you have uh, three patches of uh, the dots in the graph for small volumes, which typically are the ones uh, that people are using at laboratory scale. Um, it shows uh, what is the scale of uh, the sleep velocity that they are, they are playing with, you know, to understand the new size specificity. Um, in the middle, you have um, the, what we call the meso scale experiments. Um, and uh, many are uh, some experiments I, I did actually, or I did with some people. Uh, so I do still, because we're already in the field, that's something like a tens of meters scale, we can inject a little more volume and produce uh, a large uh, um, span of um, a large range of uh, uh, sleep velocities. And um, I issue only two points because um, um, this is for the larger, let's call this the industrial volumes. And I took uh, two uh, interesting points, I would say. Uh, one is the um, uh, bank earthquake of was 95.5. The estimated uh, CC velocity uh, was quite um, large. Uh, and the other one, so the point of quake is uh, what we think uh, a fault reactivation directly with a complex way to reactivate. Um, and another one is uh, an earthquake that occurred in the Alberta Basin. This one was caused by a, a hydrofracking treatment that uh, reactivated uh, the fault and uh, created an earthquake. Um, but um, People try to define different regimes of uh, uh, fault movements. You see that the very uh, slow velocities, they call this creep or slow sleep. Um, intermediate velocities, they call this eight speed. That's a big, uh, <laughs> a big uh, um, variability here. And when it gets very fast, uh, they say it may be six. Of course, these, uh, these dash lines are not. Uh, there are flexible frontiers, I'd say. But um, this uh, just simple graph is uh, raising a few questions that are interesting to, to look at. Um, the, the, of course, uh, uh, it shows uh, that there is a complex relationship between force sleep and injected volume. Uh, always, I would say, it's a line <laughs> between all the points, and that's far from being the case. Uh, so you see that for the same injected volume, you have a variability of uh, um, the second point is, uh, okay, you have a slow, a little faster and very fast. Um, is there a transition between these regimes? Does it start slow and accelerates? Or can it suddenly accelerate and create an earthquake? Uh, you know, behind that, there are different physics. And um, we are yet uh, still trying to understand that. I would say we, we don't exactly know if all these physics are correlated to each other, or if they coexist altogether, or if at a given depth or for a given state of stress or a given type of fault, one physic is dominating the other. And the last question is uh, obviously also a scale effect. Scale effect, which is interesting because 
All that is the developer of course, is, is part from the industrial scale, you see. Um, and um, the intermediate scale is still very small. You see it's low, low scale here. Uh, so um, that's the, the question is, can we upscale? Uh, when uh, we observe at the lab scale where we control everything, uh, does it match with what we see at the intermediate scale, the mesoscale, which is still in the field, but uh, still not enough uh, when we talk about the volumes that are used during these experiments? Can we have seen this due to the larger ones, the industrial ones? So, here are the three questions, and I'm not going to answer these questions, I'm just going to try to, to illustrate a little. Um, how I organize, I would say, my, my research around that. Um, and the first, ah, yeah. oh yeah, it works. The, the first thing is, um, okay, we are talking about sleep. Uh, uh, let's try to measure sleep first. Uh, and that's uh, really what I've been trying to do for years. Um, most, okay, many of you might know uh, this kind of uh, device I've been developing for years. This is a ball probe uh, that can now be, since I arrived at, um, at the lab, I would say, uh, all my time was to bring that kind of code that I started to design in France, to bring it to very large depths, high pressures, and now high temperatures. So that's all the work that we have been doing. So now we can go to very high pressure, like uh, 60 megapascals, for example. And decent uh, temperatures, let's say we are now at 150 degrees, it's uh, still a bit cold, but it's better than before. Uh, so this probe, what is it doing? If you go into a hall, it's better if it's an open hall, but you can work through a case hall also. And um, you identify a fault or a fracture. Um, you can lower it across the, uh, the fracture at the ball. And uh, using two packers, this is the, let's say, call it a class, uh, classical spider packer system, you can uh, seal uh, a section of the ball uh, across the photo. And the, the, the main thing of this probe is that between two trackers, you have that sensor that can be count on uh, both walls of uh, the fracture. And then you can make a test, which we call a hydromechanical test, uh, by uh, increasing the pressure, for example, between the two trackers until the fluid starts to penetrate into the fracture and make it move in three dimensions. Because the other interesting thing is that sensor can measure the displacements of the fault, so it's measuring the relative displacement of one wall of the fault relative to the other in three dimensions. Okay, um, so we've been developing that for quite a while, and recently um, we made a small one, uh, a laboratory one, which is uh, you see the scale is one centimeter, uh, 10, 10 millimeter, one centimeter. Can I go back to the big one? Yeah, so your fault zone. Has to be between the two anchor points, right? So yeah, you can't do a larger gouge zone with this one. We can vary the length of um, between these two anchors right. here. I, I, I didn't put the yeah, there is a length, but the probe can be longer, especially this, this length was really longer. Or uh, we have different possibilities. We can vary the length between two anchors, or we can do a string of anchors uh, if we want to have a the high resolution uh, inside the photo. You know, we 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 did both, and but the tool you have at the lab is the six meter tool. Right? That's the one that the lab. Yeah. But at the lab, what we have actually, we have trackers, we have the sensor, and depending on the project, we have some more uh, different lengths or, as I said, different strings of sensors. Uh, um, and there's no physical connection between the two anchors. Um, no, when. Uh, when the probe is anchored to the lower wall, there is no physical connection. Yeah. Which is the, uh, the which has been followed, the, the main technical thing that we had to fix, you know, because a deep ball probe with something that is floating <laughs> in the middle, it's, uh, it's quite tricky to, uh, to deploy. And so um, that's uh, a little tricky. And so I was saying, we made a small one, <laughs> a very small one. Which is only uh, one centimeter long, but uh, basically it's, it's exactly the same, okay. the same at a different scale. You have two small packers, and um, you have the onboard here and there, and uh, here you have uh, this system, which are optical fibers actually, and um, each, uh, each fiber is measuring a, 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 a linear action strain, 
And uh, because there are different directions, uh, this is how we can reconstruct the large space. And why we did that um, is because, um, okay, this is very interesting. As I said, you, you can go to uh, real for zone and say, but um, we thought it would also be interesting to go back to lab where obviously the space conditions and everything is much better controlled than in the field. But we wanted to go back to the lab with a, a downscale protocol, and not only the protocol as I showed here, but the downscale uh, measurement, the same thing in the lab as um, in, the, in the field, to really be able to compare. So that's a uh, thing, and I will show later an experiment at that scale that we did, but let me come back to this later. So this is an old experiment, but I think um, um, uh, I, I start with that. It's um, one we I did in 2015 now, it's quite old. <laughs> but um, this was a field uh, experiment done in France. Um, and it is an example of uh, what we can get from uh, this, this tool. Uh, plus around the tool, of course, we always have a it's figure the little here. You see the, the scale of the experiment, it's uh, tens of meters. This is the schematic view of uh, the, the fault that's testing. And uh, the, the probe that I showed in previous slide is here. And around we have a balls with a, a seismic sensor. Okay. Um, so the experiment was relatively basic. We only had the two seismic sensors. But what I want to show is uh, what you see on these curves. So what we did here, uh, if you look at the uh, so the, the horizontal axis of the curve is, is the time duration since we started injecting into the poles. And then uh, you have a blue curve, which is showing the, the pressure that we increased step by step uh, into the into the fold zone. We have straddled the fold zone, as you see uh, on the right with two packers, and we increase step by step the pressure into the fold. Um, and uh, you also have the injection flow rate that we, we use to increase the pressure. Okay. And um, then you have two black curves, one continuous black and one dashed line. Uh, the continuous black is showing the, the false slip, so um, that we measure with the probe. And the dashed line is uh, uh, measuring the opening of the fault, so the displacement perpendicular to the fault plane. Um, and what you may see is a typical curve. We, we reproduce that in different contexts. Um, is um, that uh, when you start an injection like this, you obviously will have an acceleration of the seat. Okay, it, it always more or less so this kind of uh, of curve. And um, during the acceleration, the other thing that we need to see is that um, all the while you will have a large fold opening. You see the dash curve is, uh, and you see the the the, the scale on the, on the right of uh, the displacements. Until I would say about this this time here, at, uh, let's say one thousand seconds, you have as much opening of the fault as you have seen, and suddenly, suddenly, and then you have an acceleration of the slip while you have a much more slip than the opening. That's kind of typical, and uh, and the other thing we we saw on that experiment is um what you see on the lower uh, curve, which is the community number of uh, uh, seismic events that were produced by that experiment. And uh, you see that um, it starts to increase after some time. And uh, basically, it starts to increase when you have um, that acceleration of the seismic. Um, so, yeah, well, sorry. That, this is typical, and that's actually what's my question. Yeah. Um, because sometimes you have a question about the chicken and the egg, right? Does the fall open first and then it slip? Yeah. Or does it uh, slip and opens up volume and then the water rushes into it? Yeah. And when we look at the geysers, we believe it's fall opening first and then slip, but we are never sure on the person. Well, then um, you, 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 you may have a, a variability around that, which we mainly depend on how your fault is oriented versus the initial state of stress. So if we, as we say, it's poorly oriented versus the stress, it's far from what we call the critical state of stress. Um, at least at the beginning, you will always have some share, some sleep, uh, but uh, you will have much more opening than sleep. Uh, so if I had to go here, you will have the dash curve much higher and a very little sleep. 
And after a while, only you will use the tools, but you will always have the acceleration of the seat. Okay. And that is the same whether you have fracturing or hydro steering? Um, I, I, with this device, the problem is that uh, I always measure um, uh, a, sh a share component because in 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 real life, I would say uh, you are always in a, in a three axial a true three axial state of stress. So so you always have a even if it is small, you will have, have a, what we call a deviatory stress that allows from uh, some share. But as I said, uh, you could say that uh, uh, hydro fracturing would be the case where you have a much more opening uh, than C. But you will still have an acceleration. If you develop your fracture, you fract your hydro fracture, and we show that in an experiment, sir. I, I don't I don't have that. Uh, but um, after a while, when your hydro fracture becomes large enough, it starts to react as, as a small fault and it starts to share because it's uh, it's, uh, it's 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 a weak, it, it turns into a weak uh, fracture because it's open and it starts to slowly share. But you said you only you only measure shear for the opening is for norm. Yeah, opening is the statement. Yeah. Normal. So you measure that. Yeah, yeah, we measure that. And uh, and so the other thing is, uh, um, I the specificity only occurs after some AC speed displacement of the pole, which was something uh, I think we were some of the first to show it in, in the field, and to highlight that maybe. Uh, in addition to the seismic component of the fault movement, there could also be some A seismic component. And so all the question after that was, again, uh, what is the role of the A seismic component on in triggering the seismic one? And um, I'm not going to go too much into that today, but um, this kind of acceleration, this kind of classical, you know, when we call you the support of the rate and state physics, for example, uh, that's uh, because uh, they say, okay, when you have a, a, an acceleration of the sink, uh, the friction of the port is, is decreasing with that acceleration, and you go to potentially insta unstable system. So that was um, also kind of a um, uh, result uh, of a field of verification of this kind of uh, possible theory to explain how you, you switch from uh, a system to c uh, when the port is activated. I have one more question and then I shut up. Okay. No, 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 no. Uh, the, uh, how do you define a seismic event? You say you have slip before. Yeah. Ah. But what, how do you define this as a slip versus a seismic event? Um, you, I would say um, the seismic events is when I measure something on the seismic sensors. So it maybe depends on um, the, the technical characteristics of the sensors. So you may tell me, maybe during this period, there are some uh, very high frequency sensors that I'm not seeing, like acoustic ones, because in this case, I had a relatively uh, low frequency, or uh, I would say classical seismic sensors. So yeah. And they're in the other borders, right? So they are not on your sensor, they're a distance away from you. Yeah, they're a distance away, quite close to see a few meters. Um, yeah. And, um, but yeah, there could be some, Acoustic events, and you, you will see uh, uh, in some experiment. And actually, yeah. So first thing I want to show you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's the first slide. <laughs> <laughs> I told you today to reduce the number of slides to ten. <laughs> no, I think we are looking. We are looking, we are looking into fifty slides at the very least. This is thirty. <laughs> so. <laughs> Basically, my 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 only question is, what do you think? I mean, it seems like you need to raise the injection rate and the pressure to a certain level at which you see that slip is accelerating, mm -hmm. and you start producing seismicity. So at least in time, yeah. they they coincide. So do you think that it's pressure at play? Or do you think that uh, actually, actually, you need to uh, blow in enough fluid into into the fault to start to start slipping quickly? Um, so um, maybe I, I answer later to that because I want to show Great. you uh, okay uh, what's happening when you go to the lab. Maybe 
Uh, and, uh, and then we can discuss that a little later. Uh, okay, I will mark okay. this question. Thank because you. to give a, I would say, more well, complete answer, I, I, I need a little more slides. The uh -huh. assumption the way to, to go to the second slide of the box. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we try to reproduce that. Look at that stage. <clears throat> uh, so that scale uh, here is the setting. Uh, that's a block of granite which is cut uh, into uh, into sub blocks with a vertical uh, fracture. And uh, you might see, well, you see the mini city here, how it looks like. That's only the central. So this is the, you see the scale. Okay. Uh, and uh, we we drilled two more holes uh, in the block. Uh, I think you see here, for example, on the for those who don't see me, uh, look on the lower uh, right. Um, you see the, the, the white right people are because you want to have a monitoring board. Uh, so the thing is starting to you know, see uh, the, the fracture. Uh, and um, outside the block, uh, we had a set of uh, acoustic sensors that you see here. Okay. Um, and uh, all this uh, was uh, set into, uh, I didn't put it, but it's kind of a terrible thing, which is a uh, uh, triaxial press. Uh, so we can really impose uh, uh, different uh, stresses in the three directions of the space, um, and um, and so we we reproduced um, about the same protocol as, as we do in the field. Um, so first on the left uh, you have the uh, we call it the boundary conditions uh, that we apply on the block. So you see in that case, so the block is seen from above, okay. Uh, you see the, the fault, which is uh, um, uh, cutting the block into sub blocks. The dashed line are the two walls, uh, where uh, we have the same things. Um, at the boundaries of the blocks, we have a single pressure boundary. Okay, uh, and um, the, the arrows are showing that in that experiment, we are applying a deviatory stress um, of uh, two megapascals, uh, as you see here. Okay. Um, and um, and so that's the initial state. Okay. Sorry, is it dry or is it not? Uh, it's a saturated box, uh, and then we're going to, in that saturated fracture. We're going to uh, add pressure uh, uh, following the set pressure protocol. But the fracture is initially saturated with water uh, at uh, at low pressure. Actually, uh, we may well, you don't see it here, but we have. Uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, uh, we get a set of uh, pressure in, in the room. What kind of rock is it? It's a granny. Uh, and uh, so it's basically impermeable, right? So, yeah, the, 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 the rock is uh, considered impermeable. Yeah, so it's mm -hmm. sitting in the fraction of the borehole. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the fluid. Thing. Yeah. And, and so on the right is the protocol. So here we, uh, we apply uh, uh, the flow rate step by step. You see the green curve is producing a set pressure increase uh, by the monitoring points. So one is the CP monitoring point, the blue one. Okay. Uh, and um, this is the result we get when we do that. So uh, a bit a complex slide, but on the right you have the time variation of uh, upper graph is the the pressure that I showed before at the CP and lower graph. Uh, the red graph is showing the the, the sleep on the um, so the torus, the displacement torus to the, the fracture plane, and the blue graph is showing uh, the displacement perpendicular uh, to the plane. Okay, measured by the sleep. The horizontal axis is the time, as you see, and um, what you may see is that um, uh, there is a kind of period uh, until uh, let's say uh, one o'clock here. And, Look at time on, on my graph uh, where you have as much opening as uh, you have seen. Uh, the blue and the red pairs are very close to each other. And then you get to that uh, time here, which corresponds to that pressure over there. And we come back to what pressure it means, where you see off um, what we call a main seat event. Um, and, uh, and then you, we, we release the pressure. Okay. And uh, to prove that it was a uh, really a steep event, you can see that, that uh, the red curve uh, stays with uh, an offset 
uh, which means that it was really a plastic displacement that you produce. Why um, the opening? The fault uh, because we reduce the pressure, the, the fault flows after that. Okay. Um, so, first uh, thing that we can see from that is we see a little like we see in the field. The start here where we have a sip and opening people, I would say, so a lot of what I would call dilation at this time, until you get to pressure where you, I would call this the main sip duct. Okay, it means that at this time there is much more sip uh, than there is uh, opening. Be careful that this is corresponding to a small increase in the volume. It's so small for the increase that you don't see. Okay, the drop is when we we stop everything. It's after. Okay. Um, if you want to see what's happening in 3D, you go to the left. Uh, and to the left in 3D, you have the, the fault uh, of the block. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the black line is the, is the small hole where we have the symphony. And um, you have the displacement in 3D as they are measured by that mini symphony. And uh, you see uh, the period here uh, that I where see is. Called dilation, okay, uh, where you progressively start sharing the fracture, but um, if you compare the amount of slip and the amount, uh, sorry, the amount of slip so parallel to the fracture and uh, the amount of displacement normal to fracture, you, you really see that you have uh, about the same amount. And then the next one is what you see at the end here, okay? Um, and um, the main event, you may tell me, does it match with the deviatorix stress or the shape of the stress tensor that we apply uh, with our triaxial setting? Yes, this works. Uh, you can see it over there. You have uh, the stress orientation um, in a theoretical projection. Uh, the, the line is the fracture. So, in this kind of context, it's the stress movement that should it mean that the vector should be horizontal. So, that's the small. Point on the edge of the circle over there, and it's as you see here, it's really match with what we observe, what we measure. But the interesting thing, yeah, sorry. Uh, so, for me, it's hard to interpret the 3D graph here. So, do we, it looks like we have a fair amount of updated movement. And uh, or it's just an impression. It's that an impression. It's okay, so uh, it doesn't really yeah. move up no, so much. No, okay. no, no, it's, it's an impression. And um, um, so, because it's an impression, part of what the best one you can take uh, two points here, you find the vector, and look at the what is the orientation of the vector. That is, the vector corresponds to the points you have over there on the surface. So, yeah. okay, oh, that's three or horizontal uh, spacement that we have. Um, so, what is interesting is what I did with that uh, as results at the top. Um, the slip movement matches with the tensor we, we did put on that uh, small fold. Um, we see a dilatant period before we have an event, a slip event. Uh, and the interesting thing is that when we have the event, if you look uh, in the lower part here, and if you just take a morphological diagram, um, you are here. So, uh, sorry for those <laughs> who are not. Uh, you, you are uh, way beyond uh, the Kuno line. Okay. So, it's so, so, so it means that uh, to have the event, you must put a lot of over pressure on your fault. Okay. Um, so, that's an interesting result. Okay. So, we try to understand why. Uh, but before, I'm just to show you that we created some seismicity for acoustic seismicity here, uh, acoustic events. So be careful, this uh, uh, time period, the horizontal axis is only a few seconds, and it really corresponds to what is happening uh, uh, during, uh, during the main event. And we don't have anything before, uh, during uh, that period of the year, where we had uh, small slips and as much uh, dilation as much opening as during the time we had nothing. And uh, in detail, uh, even this simple experiment as you see here is creating quite a complex uh, set <laughs> complex sequence of uh, of events. There are some more shocks, there is a main shock and there are some aftershocks. I, I passed because I'm not a geophysicist but <laughs> how, how big was the uh yeah the main shock 
relative. It looks like the aftershocks are the same magnitude as the, the main shock. Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, at this time, uh, um, there, there is some control by the boundaries of the blocks. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's something we... Um, I if, if we look uh, yeah, at the, the frequency content of the different events, they, they, they change with time. Even if the magnitude of the amplitude of the the, the waves look the same, you know, we can see that. Yeah. So no, I said you can see that we're changing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you go back to the last slide? I didn't want to ask a question, but it's your own fault. You said this is really interesting, and I don't understand yeah. this. So I'm looking at your blue Moore circle. Okay. The, the blue circle. So you're increasing the pressure. The radius increases. Yeah. And how do you get from there to your blue dot on the left side? I don't understand that because from what you said or understand, the blue dot on the left side is when you have uh, the slip, right? Yeah, this, this blue dot is when you, you are here. Right, but how? Uh, so you translate by, uh, you, you basically take, uh, uh, I would say, the, um, uh, well, you, you, you just uh, subtract to the normal stress the, the amount of pressure you, you are injecting at the injection point. And that's the trick, actually. Oh, so you reduce the normal pressure that... By reducing the normal stress or the effect of normal stress. After failure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's basic... Uh, well, it's, no, yeah, yeah. You yeah. just reduce the effective normal stress. But uh, that's the trick, actually. It's because here we, we take the, the pressure at the injection point. And then certainly the... The, the pressure inside the fault is not, uh, it's, it's confined, it's not homogeneous, and I'm going to show you where. Right. Yeah. So, so what's happening uh, after the main event exactly with the system? You stop pumping fluid, right? Yeah. We saw, but the stress remains the same. Yeah. The, the boundaries. Yeah. Stress. Yeah. So, it's not like system became fully relaxed, like you relax the, the stress of nothing. No. So, no, no, uh, and uh, that's a good question because uh, we may say we, we uh, for a while that is quite short, we are in a kind of um, transient mode, <laughs> uh, like um, uh, a quick test, I would say. So you, you do not impose any more pressure, but you still have your deviatory stress applied on the weakened fracture, so it can still move a little. Uh, did, did you have any LVDT, so anything on the boundary? Yeah, we, we had, but they were less uh, good than <laughs> the city. <Okay. laughs> because um, because actually, um, that's the, the big improvement of the city. They are too far uh, from um, from uh, the, the center of where everything is happening, you know, from the There's a, an attenuation of the displacement uh, yeah. uh, at the at boundary. It's not the block just doing that, it's a uh, it's block, you know. Uh, which in a way is good because we, we don't have a... So that's that's exactly what yeah. I was wondering about. Yeah. And so um, to try to see uh, uh, the first uh, point here, uh, if we, uh, um, why do we go beyond the um, uh, line? Uh, we, we changed uh, the roughness of the, of the fort, you know? Uh, we made the rest of breath. Uh, well, that was actually what I was showing before. And then we pushed, I mean, it's simple. <laughs> we changed the roughness. We decreased the roughness by a factor of 10. And uh, this is what we call a smooth. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I show the station because it's easier to understand. When you take a uh, smooth uh, fracture, you see that um, it's uh, it's very, uh, you lower the permeability of the fracture. And um, for example, um, the pressure. Uh, is much more confined, uh, close to the injection point. That's the point as that, for example, it takes some, even some time for uh, the, the pressure to reach the monitoring point, you see, and they're very close. Compared to the case, uh, the initial case, we see the rough structure, which was higher than the board. And um, the interesting thing is that uh, in that case, you see it's the point B. To activate your board now, you must go there. Okay, you get the same acceleration except that uh, you can uh, you can forget about no. Okay, uh, with that, uh, the other interesting thing, and that is quite known also, 
we we took um, uh, P4 and JFT, we, we we took the dry block, and this time uh, we we just um, um, applied different normal stress to the fracture. Okay, while measuring the CP. So in that case, the CP, you see what I'm showing on the right. Uh, you have uh, the normal stress that we vary, and the horizontal axis is uh, the sensitive uh, closure. This time, because we, we increase normal stress, okay, on the on the, on the dry fracture. This time, there's no pressure in it. Uh, and I show this graph. There's another one with four. Okay, just look at the continuous black lines. Uh, this is the variation um, uh, closing and uh, uh, so opening closing. You know, so we load and unload uh, the normal stress in the fracture. In the case of the smooth fracture, as here, it's the same scale here, but it's uh, the variation in the case of the rough fracture. And um, if you look at the simply normal displacement, we have much more normal displacement in the case of the rough fracture. So, in other words, the rough fracture is less steep or more compliant uh, than the smooth fracture. Okay. Um, and this uh, is now. That uh, depends on the, the number of contacts of asperities, mainly, and uh, the smooth fracture has more contacts than uh, the rough fracture, so it's, it is more stiff. But this will have a big ball, um, and uh, I should have shown the curve, but if I were showing you the curve, um, it would play a huge role um, during that period. The smooth fracture has almost no dilation, and suddenly uh, it gets to the main event. So the stiffness of the fracture in that case uh, plays a role in the, uh, the, the what you call the, the charging of the system. You know, uh, uh, a stiff fracture will have a very fast charging and suddenly uh, a stiff event. Uh, a compliant fracture will take more time, much more dilation, will be more permeable also, uh, and. Um, and, and so you will add much more of this initial part. Back to uh, the large scale. In fact, the large scale for me is, uh, is, is a little larger. <laughs> Back to the field. Um, so this time we're in Switzerland. Uh, and um, it's an underground laboratory. Uh, the rock here is the is a, is a gray rock. It's, uh, uh, it's um, roughly there is about 60 percent of clay minerals in, in that sort. It's called the Panin Spade. And, and there is a fault. Uh, you see the galleries of the lab at the top here. All these blue uh, blue things are the galleries of the underground labs. We are at about uh, 360, 17 meters below the surface. Okay. And so there is a fault in the fault, which is a fault zone. And this is why I took this example. Um, uh, it's a um, be mainly, I would say, defined to make it simple by two complex surfaces. You see these undulating uh, surfaces, uh, and in between, you have what we call the fault zone. Okay, uh, so typically the fault zone, and this is what I want to show you now. Fault is not a plane, it's not a surface, it's a zone. Okay, and we're going to see uh, what are the effects of uh, the complexity that the fault cannot be considered only as a frictional surface. Uh, in details, it's in between these two planes, it's terrible. Uh, you, you find all kind of uh, terrible things. I, I, if you want, I can talk for uh, 10 years about this, but uh, you have uh, uh, fractures uh, at different scales. Uh, you have this, you know, material which is completely destroyed, no equation, nothing. Um, so, so, so is it is it a desiccation of the structure? No, 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 it's, no, 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 it's a uh, uh, it looks well, actually uh, here. I, I you see it's me uh, breaking it into pieces when you take it uh, from the top, it looks like that. So, if you look well, it's, it's completely uh, cut into small, small uh, uh, lenses. They call this the sky clay because the clay is cut at all stages. So, it's not like uh, as they dry down. No, 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 no. okay, no, 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 not that. So, so it's the French, no, no, no. no. Uh, and um, and uh, I did that to show that this material here had no coefficient. Um, and uh, you also have uh, uh, in this photo, because it's clay, it's adding some complexity. You see, you, you have some uh, um, reorientation of the minerals. You see the 
So the Italian effects, uh, which are kind of classical in this type of So there we go. Inside the for <laughs> plenty of proteins. Um, what type of rock is this then? Is that clay? It's a it's clay, so it's it's, it's, it's it's a clay, um, it's it's a shale rock with uh, more of uh, about 60% of clay minerals. The remaining minerals, carbonates, pyrite, uh, uh, maybe. Okay, and it's it's only that more it's the it's it's just so oh, it's uh, 370 meters. So that, that's the yeah, but before the, the linear was brought to about uh, 1.5 kilometers, and then it was affected by some uh, It's We call this an over consolidated clay, okay? Uh, because now it's at 350 meters, but it went down to something like 1.5 kilometers. Uh, and um, and actually, that uh, we, we why do we work also here? It's because um, it's, it's an analog to many things. You know, for uh, the Swiss want to store uh, their nuclear waste uh, uh, repository this type of rock. Uh, and it's also, um, um, if you go in the center of Switzerland, you find it at uh, one kilometer depth, and it's a cap off for what could be below uh, potential uh, storage site costing. So this is also why uh, they made this laboratory. And uh, we, we use it for, because there is a uh, here. And, um, and here I'm showing, um, uh, I'm going to show you a little more than only these 3D displacements. Because it's, it's such complex, um, a complex uh, volume, I would say, that uh, it's not with our small fault uh, probe, we, which is measuring uh, the relative displacement between point A and point B that we can characterize the system. And so we uh, we also are using this lab to, to test uh, what can be um, the performance of uh, uh, different type of uh, monitoring systems. So, um, for example, um, uh, this time we are using for all the Terra case. Um, so we have our system inside the casing. There's literally we can do this also. And uh, behind the casing, uh, cemented, uh, we did put all type of optical fibers. Um, so that, only two types, I would say, but we have different types of uh, uh, um, uh, monitoring techniques, I would say, from DAS, DS, etc. So we wanted to see uh, what kind of signal we can get from these uh, optical fibers uh, that could relate to the fault activation, okay? And uh, the other thing we, we did is, um, if you look on the, on the right, you have a 3D view, very schematic of the, the setting of the experiment. Again, you see the scale is about uh, 50 meters by 50 meters. Um, the, the plane here is the fault, but remember it's a zone that just include the fault, but the, the plane to, to make it simple. And all the lines are balls, and you see there are red and blue balls, uh, which are not uh, cross cutting the faults. Uh, the, the blue balls are above the fault, they are in what we call the hanging wall of the fault, uh, and the red ones are uh, below the fault, what we call the foot wall. And you see the blue stars are seismic sources uh, that we activate to send uh, waves uh, through the fault. They are received on the, the red triangles, which are then uh, uh, receivers. Okay, um, it's a system that has been developed at Berkeley. The Chasm, for those who know, uh, continuous active source uh, uh, S monitoring. <laughs> uh, and um, and so um, uh, here we, we wanted to see if the Chasm would be able to see something while we are activating the port. Basically. Uh, if you take a classical uh, cross-section carbon to the fault, this is what you may see here uh, on the, the upper left. You see the fault zone in the middle, you have the, the receivers in the foot wall, the sources in the hanging wall, and we're sending this across the fault. You see here the fault is that kind of linear that we have uh, simplified. And we are injecting in the fault, we want to activate the fault. Why we are doing that, we are permanently um, sending waves through the system, and we are trying to see changes in the in the waves. And this is what I'm going to show you. Do you know what the repetition rate of the sources are? Uh, the repetition rate, uh, you mean? Uh, How often do you fire them? Once a second, once every two, five seconds, the seismic sources. Um, I have it in the in the following slide in um, in the additional slides. I can check. Uh, what I know is that. Um, 
uh, the conflict interrogation of all the system it takes about six minutes to interrogate all sources of combinations. Uh, and uh, and uh, and it's continuously done. So uh, the idea is then to look uh, before and after. You're not trying to find anything during the slip with this seismic system. Uh, you will see because uh, we uh, actually we are, we adjusting the little the, the protocol in order to have enough time to to make this interrogation of about six minutes. So we are not seeing the very fast sleep, but we I am going to show you just after that. And is, is, are these uh, the um, the borehole chasm sources that are like top out at about two kilohertz or are they are uh, frequency? No, that's uh, th that's the frequency. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it two kilohertz or is it uh, do you know that? Let me go straight, maybe. Yes, and this one happens from the top. I think it is somewhere. Okay, it's 100 nanoseconds. Yeah, but I have it somewhere. So to have pre precision of 100 nanoseconds, you need to have frequency around uh, 20, maybe 30 kilohertz. So it's uh, these are small piezo, uh, piezo ceramic crystals. Yeah. I thought that was done by stacking that you get that. I think they use some stacking. No, so stacking, stacking yeah. helps, of course, but I believe that uh, at least these numbers, they are more typical for this high frequency, guys. Well, they have a band pass from 0.5 to 8 kilohertz. So yeah, but it's, it's got to be more than that then for all of the source. Well, fantastic. Sorry for the people online. I need uh, more if you can. So, can you, okay, okay, can you go and explain? Let me help you. <laughs> Let me take over your talk. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 Do, which one? <laughs> what? No, no. Oh, sorry. Okay. Let me switch the uh, shirt. But uh, actually, this is an example of uh, what uh, we did. Um, the upper graphs, okay. The, 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 the x axis of the graphs is the time, okay? Uh, and um, the upper graph is showing how we uh, activate the code. So you see, we, we did uh, six uh, cycles. Uh, this time we are we made it very simple for for the reason that we wanted to have time to, to make the image actually. So we inject the constant and constant flow rates. That's the rate here for uh, periods of uh, between I would say ten minutes and. Uh, the latest one is number 20 minutes long. Okay. Uh, so, um, and then um, as you see, we, we stop, we, we do what we call a shutting. So, we just stop injecting, but we shut the, the pressure everywhere in the code. And we wait for a while, about 30, 40 minutes, and we will we, we, um, either start it with small. Um, uh, flow rate injection and we increase uh, during the first cycle. And then the last four, as you see, it was just repeating or waiting the same thing. Uh, and uh, this was really adaptive because uh, of the, uh, the active shifting nature. Uh, and uh, we have an example of what uh, they get from uh, that. So uh, that's the time, uh, uh, the delay time between the, the source and the receiver. <coughs> Uh, and um, what you see uh, here is that, uh, uh, except for the first cycle, uh, for the, the following ones, uh, there is a, a clear correlation between uh, uh, when we inject in the fault and uh, uh, it, 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 when you see the, the change in the delay time, the increase in the delay time. Um, 
And uh, the other thing that you can also observe is uh, at the end of the experiment uh, on, the, on the right here, uh, you have a, a set uh, in the delay time compared to, well, to before. There was no set, of course. Um, so, um, so uh, obviously, there is a good correlation between uh, uh, the, the pressurization or the, the volume of fluid we put into that boat and the changes in the, uh, the delay times. Uh, there is a quick one. Yeah, I know. I know we are behind, but so this pressure drop after the last shot in does it have any meaning? That guy here. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's no meaning. It's not. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not. In fact, we are we are playing with different meanings. <laughs> uh, so uh, and um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, also um, uh, now I I need the lower graph. Uh, the lower graph is showing the four displacements this time, which are measured at the injection point with the, the same device. Uh, so the blue uh, is the displacement normal to the fault, so the opening or the closing, and the red is the displacement torque. So, okay. uh, and what you see is that uh, uh, during uh, each uh, period of injection, uh, you have a uh, the sharing, I would say, in red, associated to an opening in blue. Okay. Um, and uh, that might uh, obviously relate to the, the changes in the daytime. And uh, at the end, and also during, you might see that uh, uh, or in between, you see some, uh, uh, um, some um, slow movements, I would say, that are no more associated to, because we stop, we stop at this time injecting. So uh, uh, this is kind of the script that is developing uh, between uh, the periods of injection. Uh, and at the end, you see a strong uh, residual or offset value of uh, uh, percent displacement. Uh, and also, you see a, a slight uh, offset in the, in the closing. The, the fault flows more uh, than before, so you have the compaction of the system. Okay. Oh, because if we can destroy, destroy, destroy the, uh, uh, yeah, by sharing you destroy the spirit yeah. and then you create the compaction. And 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 so you have the pressure dependent uh, effect that correlates with the seismic waves, and you have uh, the 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 irreversible effect, the long term effect uh, that is also correlating with some residual observation on the P waves. Um, so now if you look at the images, um, so remember there were six injection cycles. So this is why um, in the upper row, I am showing six images. Each image uh, is taken um, towards, I would say, the end of the activation. So it's reactivating the process. It's uh, during the, the last minute before we, we stop injecting. Okay? So we always take the same image here. There are more than that, but we only use these. And, um, and so from left to right, uh, it's from the old set of activation is on the left. And uh, with time, you activate and you eject more and more uh, water into that foot, and you go to the uh, right image, okay? And uh, if you look at the upper row, you see clearly that there is um, a P wave uh, velocity this time, it's no more travel time converted into P wave velocity. You have the, the scale on the right a variation that uh, is characterized by a dark blue color uh, that is developing um, inside the image. The image is showing the fault you are looking uh, from in front of the fault. Okay? Uh, and um, the injection point uh, is you can see it uh, on the image, but on the first image. It's the small uh, red cross. So the image is centered on the injection point. Uh, so the first result is that um, uh, we are, are producing a kind of, uh, um, we propagate uh, a change in velocity. Naturally, I can tell you that this change in velocity is just the, the water that we are injecting that is propagating in one given direction. And that's an interesting result, actually, because we would have thought that it should have propagated radially from the injection point, 
which uh, is in the center of the image. And actually, you see it's going to the right. It's going in one given direction. And um, I will come back to this later, but uh, this is uh, explained by the fact that at this scale, there is a stress gradient in that fault that uh, is, uh, is guiding, let's say, the, the leakage in one given direction. Do you also have a figure after the compaction of the, the fault where the velocity should go up? Yeah, it, it, it does. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I don't think I reach, but I read somewhere. Because <laughs> uh, here, I, I, uh, what I did add on this figure, um, still the upper row, you may see these uh, red circles, red dots. Uh, these are the aircraft waves we could localize uh, uh, during these experiments. There are more than this, but these are the ones we could localize because that's not the perfect material. To, to localize events, it's so anisotropic, etc., and it's a strongly attenuated. So, but we have some. Are you sure that they're sitting on the fault, or are they just um, from the fault? There are uh, at, no, they are not. Uh, they, they are sitting um, on the fault zone, on the fault zone. Yeah. And, but here they are projected on this. Let's call it average plane uh, that is used also for the imaging. The fault zone thickness, I didn't say it, it's buried between two and three meters. And the ejection interval, uh, the perforated. The ejection interval is 2.4 meters. So you actually inject into the, the inside. We inject directly into the fault here. We, we straddle the fault zone and then we directly inject into the fault. And given the, the type of rock, I didn't mention that, but it's, it's a very low carbon rock. Uh, so uh, the, the, the water has no choice than to, to propagate into the field. Uh, but back to my uh, the, the few of quakes that are localized. Uh, what is interesting here is if you look at where the, the red points are localized compared to the, the blue patch, when there are most of them are either at, as a limit, for example, to take the third image uh, at the limit of the blue patch. Or if you take the first image, uh, you don't see anything, and you have earthquakes. So, to summarize, it seems that the earthquakes are outside or at the boundary of where we we are injecting, where the water is, is penetrating this fault. So, it's something very similar to the or such. Yeah. And uh, the, the last uh, interesting thing is uh, now we look at the images uh, which are uh, corresponding to the lower row. So this is work done by uh, Veronica Rodriguez, and it, she's been using uh, uh, the, the, the optical fibers. You saw we, we have the borough, uh, fibers in all the boroughs, we have quite a bunch of boroughs, and she used the low frequency tasks uh, to uh, get the, the strain then. Uh, and um, she, uh, she calculated the strains uh, in a volume, and then she cut that volume uh, with the same plane as the, the one we use above. And um, you see the result of that. If you look at the, the scale uh, on the right this time, uh, the, the red is a positive strain, so it means a dilated, um, dilation, uh, an extension, if we talk uh, strains, and the blue is a contraction. Okay, And uh, I think that's a very nice work that she did because if you compare the red with the blue, you, you can see that uh, where you have uh, the low velocities, it's where you have the extension of the fault, uh, and um, you don't see what's happening in the group. Apparently, uh, uh, the system cannot see uh, the, the contraction as well as it is seeing the extension. Okay, um, so that's the first insight to say that uh, there is also a very good correlation between the changes in the B wave velocities and, and the strains this time. Before I was showing you with the displacement with, with the strains, it's interesting because it gives us the first insight of the volumetric, in a way, uh, deformation of the photon. If yeah. so, the, do you know whether there is any physical reason or it's the overprint of the acquisition system? This stripes exactly that's they say, um, it's a uh, you may remember that there are three. Uh, through a whole thing like this, okay. uh, where you have the, the, the seismic sources, and that's the effect of the acquisition. And did, you have a similar, did you have a similar situation with the fiber? Was fiber deployed in the same ball Yeah, 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 yeah. And with the fiber, I, 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 actually, I don't know how, how she did that, but. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, it's, it's, it's quite amazing to me that she managed to get this kind of image, you know, because uh, uh, the, the fibers, it was the, the, the design uh, of uh, the board was made for the, 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 the active seismic. It was not made to make an in, 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 in interpolation between the fibers. So, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's kind of a very, very funny work. Yeah, uh, I think you said it already, but remind me, these are different time steps along yes. the same injection scenario. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, as I said, um, if I just show back one slide, uh, it's uh, basically it's at uh, the end, one image at the end of each uh, uh, injection uh, cycle. Nice. Okay, but we're still injecting, it's, it's not or it's before we stop the injection. Okay. So to summarize, that's a small sketch to go back to seismicity. <laughs> Very simplified fault uh, zone in the place. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, we also had something that that experiment was uh, we were lucky all along, I would say, because we had balls here that were in the direction of the propagation of uh, uh, the uh, the low velocity, and they connected actually, and so the pressure increasing these balls. We also had some chemical system that we could monitor and prove that it was really the water we were injecting in the upper ball that was coming out here. So it was really good. Um, and um, as I said, the, the, the stars are the, 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 the seismic events outside. I just want to show you a little more about that, how they look like. Uh, so they can happen, um, I would say, in time. <laughs> we, we just took uh, two here, but there are a bit more. And they happen. Uh, there is, in my mind, there's no real logic. <laughs> uh, and um, there is still uh, no real logic. I was a bit uh, too, uh, too strong about that. There is one. Uh, if you look at the upper left here, um, the, so the lower graph, uh, horizontal axis is the time. The lower graph is the, the loading. You see the, the flow rate and the pressure. The upper graph is the cumulative number of events. Okay, that we see over this experiment. And you see that obviously uh, uh, the number of events is increasing when we are injecting. Okay, uh, in the experiment, we have a period where there is more, and uh, we think that the period which corresponds to the third cycle is really when it's moved and connected to this ball. And after that, we think that maybe we have less because it was then connected and the ball was kind of controlling uh, the, the pressure and the pole. So. Um, maybe there was a kind of bias uh, in our experiment this time. So, did you try to estimate the magnitudes of this? Uh, I think it, um, it's a chat hop who tried that. It did not manage uh, for any reason. Um, we were using DMG uh, sensors, and there were the same that were used at SURF, and the same problem as in SURF, they were not enough well calibrated, for what I understood, uh, to, to estimate the magnitudes. Uh, so what we try to do, by the way, uh, is um, two things. The first thing was to use uh, the, the variations in the P-wave velocities in a, in a kind of rock physics model. Um, so the support uh, you see here, I made it simple, was here at, at the thin layer with the spheres. And, um, and uh, uh, we applied in the spheres uh, the four elastic theory in a way. Uh, and um, uh, we try to reproduce the, the variation in the P wave velocities by actually varying the thickness of the layer. The larger, uh, thicker, sorry, layer will lower more the, the velocity. So, this is what we did. It was a way to estimate the changes in the thickness of the layer. Um, and of course, um, the model was 1D. So it's measuring the thickness perpendicular and thickness. <laughs> so in a way, it's as if we were measuring the displacement normal the okay. And the other thing, of course, we try to um, uh, analyze the displacements uh, that we are measuring. Uh, we are measuring in different points, but I don't want to give you the details. So to do that, we are using some uh, uh, hydromechanical uh, free propulsion models. Uh, basically, we have this displacement versus time, and we try to match this displacement, which gives us an estimate of how the, the stresses, for example, are changing during the experiment. And I'm going to show you what we can do with that. Okay. Why didn't you try to 
estimate the velocity as a function of changes in volume of water you inject. No, we, we try to estimate the changes in the volume of a sandy, so the, the changes in thickness so as a function of the changes in velocity. Because um, can instead of having the idea, I asked them, could we estimate uh, the the bulk change uh, in uh, in thickness of the fault zone, you know, uh, and and then compare to the city, for example, that we measure with this instrument, and make a kind of graph of bulk variations of the fault versus the, and see what so we are that. talking about one millimeter cumulative fault again. Yep, over two and a half meter thick zone. Yeah, right. Yeah. And what was the normal water saturation in the rock before you added water? We saturated with the same water. Uh, no, not exactly the same water, but uh, uh, the water we inject is a kind of, there is a recipe uh, in Monterey. They try to reproduce as best as they can the same chemistry of the water as the one that is in the formation. But you said it's 100% saturated. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's fully saturated. So if you drill into it, the water comes down. Uh, it's uh, so low permeable that nothing comes out. <laughs> so we have to squeeze the rocks to get the small. Because it looked like it was almost all gouge, right? Yeah. So I would assume it would work. Yeah, no, sometimes there is a little oh. outflow, but it's really. <laughs> uh, even uh, when you inject, you have no backflow. You know, when, when you. Uh, it's just because fault is reclosing fast and uh, you get nothing back. Uh, and so, um, firstly, the estimation of the, the, the thickness that I transform into normal displacement, you remember? Okay. Uh, this is the result here that they get, uh, or they can transform their, their map of uh, velocities, a you know, variation of velocity. Here, uh, it's, it can become a, a, a variation of all thickness okay, uh, with this approach. And then they can peak to one point. For example, close to the injection point and get the variation with time of the fault thickness or again the displacement normal to the fault. And uh, this is what we have in the upper graph here is uh, the estimated fault uh, normal displacement. And then the injection point, it will be the, the blue curve you see here. And uh, you recognize you have peaks corresponding to each uh, time energy. Okay, so if you read, you have something like uh, between uh, 500 micrometers and uh, one, uh, one, one inch millimeter of uh, normal displacement of, of, uh, of the fault that they can estimate from their uh, simple model of, of the fault. Okay. Uh, the interesting thing is that we can compare again with the straight. Uh, and this is what I'm doing in the lower uh, right here uh, at the injection board. So uh, the line you see here is the injection board, and you have a, um, uh, well, let's say there is the complexity of the neurology, but uh, we, we know exactly where we are measuring in the injection board. Um, and uh, thanks to the distributed strains, you get this kind of graph uh, for each, uh, um, each uh, gauge length, I would say, along the, along the board. Uh, by, you, you clearly see where along the board you have the maximum strain, and uh, it's not a big surprise. It is the where you are injecting, and when the fault is where the fault is moving. Okay, but then you can take this graph and say, okay, the the the, the strain here, um, the, where the, where the strain is varying in the board, it corresponds uh, roughly to a, a thickness of uh, one meter. Okay. And then um, you can read the strain here. So you have five, 500 micro strains over one meter. So you have 500 micrometers okay, of displacement. And then uh, these were, if you say, it corresponds to the injection. And then it corresponds to what is estimated uh, from the other method from the lead wave velocity. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is a kind of consistency between uh, the estimation of the displacement as we can do from the distributed strain but locally where there is a board with the estimation of the displacement has can be done by this simple rock physics model using the three wave velocities. And yes, it almost looks as if you would have this you know parabolic profile of the strain. 
Yeah. So on the injection interval. So in mm -hmm. the middle of the injection interval, you have the highest strain. Uh, yeah. I have never. I, okay. I have a better side than this because <laughs> okay. it's even more complex than that. Okay. Obviously, it's always more complex when, when you start I doing want, I, I, wanted, I wanted to ask whether you have any any indication of how the fluid propagated through a fault zone. Did it find one best pathway, maybe a, a, a yeah. structure, yeah. and the, it is concentrated, or, or is it more or less uniform across the thickness? It's not uniform. Okay, thank you. And, um, if we go into details, maybe here it's a DSS. You see DSS strain, so the gauge length is not the best one we have. I have better with other type of techniques, but we can still correlate with. You see these red things are the features, the the, the main. Um, so you have the top and the bottom of the fault, but you also have secondary features. You also have this color is that uh, what we call scalically. You remember that. Thing that's highly informable. And um, if you look at uh, these three uh, blue arrows, correspond to the maximum uh, uh, strains that we measure here. So it says that uh, the zone that is mostly forming in the entire zone here is localized here. Okay, so, you, so here you have not so much trust when you, you look at the ball scale, you have a major, the top of the main fault, we call it, which is also corresponding to the principal share zone of the fault. And maybe you have the highly deformable um, lens here. So all this is explaining the strain. And um, to answer your question, we think that this is this top that is also uh, sliding dilating, and the water is is going into that uh, that fraction, for the, uh, that fault. You know, so it's very localized. Uh, maybe with time, then it gets more complicated. Uh, it, it starts to diffuse uh, elsewhere, but uh, at, the, at the scale of uh, one injection cycle, this is what we see. And it's very fast, actually. So, and if we compare, so this period of time corresponds roughly to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, according to uh, seismic monitoring, the fault is already almost closed, yeah. but the stress, what well, stress, strain in the borehole is yeah. not relaxed. And you know what? So why? It's because um, um, obviously the strain is unilateral. We are just measuring along the ball uh, with a fiber. Actually, this is because it's shared here. The ball is, is shared, and uh, and uh, the fiber cannot say that. But we can say because we have the simple also that measure the the three D displacement. I didn't plan to say that, but <laughs> you see, this is where having more than one instrument is helpful. Uh, yeah. You're saying the the strain cannot see the shearing on the borehole, or what are you saying? It, it uh, can't discriminate. It yeah, I was going to say, yeah. you, you cannot give any direction. You cannot. You can have a, so, so. an apparent extension because of shear or because of uh, axial extension. Yeah, but I thought your explanation was why it doesn't recede. No, doesn't no, recede. I was I was asking about uh, the, about the discrepancy between the opening. Right. Visible in the time of seismic, right. which is almost real life. Yeah. Well, here it stays almost at the same level. Right. And what was your explanation? Because uh, remember, uh, go back to what I showed at the lab scale. As soon as we uh, switch off the injection, port is closing, but you have that uh, residual uh, offset in, in the share, okay, uh, in the sleep. And that's exactly why here you still have a small residual of the strain. I said, as, as I was saying, here it's recovering faster. I think this method is maybe seeing the opening. And maybe also because you, you well, no, I think it may be seeing the opening because you're putting the same thing inside. So, it should not, so this method is maybe seeing the opening of the port. Uh, this method is, uh, is seeing the strains, but uh, without giving any information on the what is the cause of the strain? Is it a, a, a bending? Is it a, a, an actual extension? So it doesn't say whether it is related to share or to, uh, to pure actual extension. But relatively speaking, it should come back to the same level as in the seismic signature, right? Uh, no, it, eventually it, in time, no? Uh, if it was pure uh, losing, yes, but the whole share. And then also, uh, we did not create a, that would be a good uh, uh, advocate to say we created a hydro fracture, a pure one, but this is not the case at all here. We create a sharing with opening, you see. 
And so then it goes in and uh, yeah, taxi might be charged. <laughs> Um, and so the, the, the last thing we can do here, I'm not sure it's the last thing actually, but I can do it. <laughs> um, is uh, you can compare uh, this frontal uh, uh, axis is uh, the, the displacement, the, the normal displacement of the entire boson, okay, uh, reduced from the inversion of the wave velocity. So that's the y axis. Really? The seek of the boson directly measured uh, with uh, our uh, system. And uh, uh, because the, it's all uh, well, the measurement is direct, but this is uh, 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 an inversion, so this is why we don't have a continuous uh, curve. We just take points, points again that are taken at uh, the end of the cycle. Uh, but maybe you, you see something interesting is that there is a period. Where you have input seat in the pole zone, you see it on the horizontal axis, and much more um, uh, displacement. Okay. Uh, and then after some uh, amount of sleep, uh, you uh, or some amount of dilation, I would say, you start to have uh, not the plateau, but you have much more sleep uh, than uh, dilation. And that's the uh, Kind of what we were also seeing in the last scale, what we were also seeing, and you remember in the previous experiments. But this time, it's no more an interface. It's a bit so. So there's something happening in the bulk of that fault zone that gives uh, apparently the same um, response as the, the single plane. Um, so, what is the bulk deformation that can explain that? Um, how many hours do we have more? <laughs> so we went 24 minutes over time. So yeah, and, uh, so. I I guess we also need to give people an opportunity to sort of yeah. questions and answers. So and uh, and on, just on that side, I can talk more, but I, I can stop there. Yeah. You, you understood the idea if I go click here, is that um, there is when you inject fluids, uh, it's very important to measure uh, to try to measure. Uh, the, the displacements or the strains um, as much as you can in three dimensions, because you have a volumetric effect uh, that can uh, that can drive the way your fault is going to produce um, what I call the main slip event. It could be seismic or not. That's another question, but uh, it's very important. And uh, certainly, we are not completely yet there. We think that the that volumetric deformation. Uh, definitely depends on uh, the elastic properties uh, of um, of the fault, uh, whether it is an interface or whether it's a zone. Okay, and how these elastic properties also with time will be changing because of uh, activation. Okay, uh, a fault that is very stiff might certainly activate faster or produce a larger slip event than a fault that is uh, very soft. Mm -hmm. And I thought here. Because uh, they put the switch also to the role of the permeability, which is also changing. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> so, guys online, uh, probably, probably we'll, we'll take your questions first. If you have any, I will be uh, keeping an eye on the chat. So, because I'm sure that we will have a lot of questions from the audience. Yeah. No, I'm. Uh, if if they don't have questions, I mean, anyone? I have one final. Question. No, no, don't say that. <laughs> it's the third time today already. <laughs> I mean, he, he already said you have uh, a fault on a meter scale. And you measure one millimeter split or so or change. What is the error <laughs> on the measurement? Yeah, you, you never talk about error in, in any of these. Measures. Oh, uh, oh the, the error is the uh, well, the, the the accuracy. I would say of uh, of the sensor is um, it depends on the rock, but also. Uh, because it depends on how the sensor is clamped uh, to the rock. Uh, but I would say it's between uh, 10 and uh, 15 micrometers on the displacement. Okay. 
and the and the resolution is higher. Uh, we we get the micrometer, and sometimes uh, we get the for example, uh, we set a very high uh, sampling rate. Uh, we get to um, close to the nanometer. Uh, that's why uh, we can also see uh, something through casing. But of course, through casing, you have to correct from the effect of the casing. But uh, we can see something. Now, um, uh, that's the measurement. Uh, there is another way to consider the error. Um, as uh, you know, as you mentioned it, uh, you asked at the beginning, uh, the, the measurement is between two points at uh, a given length. And then most of the error that may be that you are across a, a, a part of the fault zone uh, that is not active, or it's only a part of the activity of the fault zone. So uh, it's, it's a, I think it's a very interesting information anywhere you put it because it gives the 3D uh, view, the direction of what's happening, you see. Uh, so, um, and, uh, and I, it's not because we develop it, but I don't see any other methods who can do that in, in the field. Uh, that's only for that, having the direction when we need to, sometimes we don't need it. David, did you have a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gabe, I, uh, I think you, you had something to ask. Yeah. I um when you're seeing the size of the vents sort of at the edge of the front of the fluid i guess is what it was i mean would you you'd expect pressure perturbation from that fluid to be extend extend beyond even further i mean then yeah actually uh, why are are the seismic events there uh, one reason could be uh, that at the front of the uh, the, three, the pressurized patch, uh, when never forget the point that slippers, okay? Um, so it's open and slippy. And so around your pressurized patch, you have what is called the shear square concentration. So it, that's at the front, it's beyond the front. Uh, and, um, and this also depends on the fault uh, mechanical properties. Uh, uh, when I say it's beyond, it can be a few centimeters beyond, or it can be tens of meters. So you are creating a zone that is much larger than your pressurized zone, which is potentially a failure or brought closer to failure just because of what you have, you have the patch of high pressure fluid that is this. Uh, and actually, this is what we see here. Um, you. You, you trigger when, when you go to creep very fast on the fault to, from uh, the division. If, if I had two more hours, I could trigger the curves. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, the reason. And the other interesting thing is that um, in this type of fault, which initially is low permeable, it helps open the fault because it, it creates enough creep and the creep can dilate a little the fault, you know, so that's the roughness of the fault. And it pre opens the fault until the creep can penetrate then and then it pressurizes the, the, the signal and it's propagating like this. Yeah. And then there is competition with how fast the current is very And it's, uh, it's even more complex. But yeah. <laughs> Any more? Uh, I know that everyone would like to finish, but I, 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 and, and we will have an opportunity to discuss more. Just basically one thing that I want to touch on before we withdraw today. So the granite block experiment. So you basically, you showed that on the Coulomb more axis, we are already in a tensile regime. Is it because we, we, we uh, it's 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 limited in space? I don't think so. It's really tricky. You are in the to the steps. I don't think so. Forget about more. It's, okay. It's just uh, you. You pressure that is is it, it. it would be in the tensile if the pressure was the same homogeneous in all your fracture. Then 
that's that's what I'm saying. That's so it's just because it's uh, spatially spatially yeah. non-uniform, etc. Yeah. So basically, this fracture is being held exactly. solid here on the boundary. So it is it is actually what what I'm trying to say. This this actually seems very similar to that experiment, right? Yeah. Where you also have this movement, yeah. so I wanted to ask whether you, uh, you have a capability to locate this acoustic emission and see whether it is also at the boundary of the movement of the moving moving something. Is uh, it a plan at least to do something like that? It's a plan, but not in this type of rock. <laughs> no, I'm uh, I'm talking about the granite block. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's the plan. Uh, but the, the new experiment we want to do with I two in Namib. Actually, uh -huh. where we we obviously we have much more seismicity, so yeah. uh, that's a collaboration with the, the Swiss people, and uh, they have identified the fault zone and, and uh, doing this kind of experiment uh, there with uh, yeah, hopefully a sensor that can see uh, better. But I think um, Roland was mentioning, and I know some papers that you see that he was that found. That's also a. Uh, uh, yeah, you know very well the guys in Germany who are working on that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and basically maybe the, the very last thing. So you have these wonderful tools. You have overly instrumented field experiments. So what, what would you need to 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 be able to reconstruct the fault activation process even better? Do you have something that you would love to have? say during this monetary experiment if if you had more money but still realistic so i don't know well would it be well, one idea that came to me like you drill post activation you drill a hole and extract the yeah. core and you see how it actually polished during the activation that, that could be one the, thing. the rock uh, or, or I, even um downscale game more you know, uh, you think there's enough slip to? Polish? I don't know. Yeah. No, but I mean, if if this one is so, yeah, yeah, maybe there is not enough slip uh, yeah. because uh, uh, you see how much we have uh, in, the, in the best case. Uh, it's probably not the right rock to polish because you have all this small right direction, right? Yeah, but then then maybe maybe not polish, but micro mi micro cracking on the lab, maybe. Yeah. Possible, yeah. Possible, possible, possible. And, yeah. Uh, at least you know right now um, that's uh, why also we developed that uh, small probe um, because uh, most of the experiments in the lab uh, before that they, they were not really uh, using the uh, fault material, especially in this type of material which is obviously hard to core. You know, yeah, it's, you can core easily, but to preserve core it's another story. You see the desiccation and kind of thing. Um, and so in the lab, what they do uh, in fault mechanics, usually they, they take the intact rock, they reduce into a powder, and uh, they they put the, the they, they make a small layer of that powder, and then they share the layer for this single share, uh, double share experiment. Uh, obviously, that's not exactly uh, like uh, what we see in, in, in the real life. Which is never what the, the objective of a large scale experiment. I agree with that. But to go one step further, uh, this is why we created the possibility to have a, a protocol that is closer to the field, you know, to, to see uh, maybe better. Also, in the lab, as I said, um, um, all the measurements are made outside the center, but most of them, especially the strain measurement. Uh, what they do often is they, they do, they still, they Put a, a displacement sensor or string at least outside the sample. And so they are not at the core of where the, 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 the fracture is, is generating or the, the fracture is activating. So that's another thing. Uh, on, that, on that note, could you, could you wrap the, the, the samples with fiber in different directions yeah. and just, yeah, yeah. is we that could, what they're doing? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have some colleagues who would start to do this in ETH uh, and they. They can wrap in a, that's a really pro promising approach to that. Yeah. yeah. And Selixa now is pitching the interrogation box for for the strain sense and uh, what? saying it's it's like one millimeter is a well, yeah. One what? Millimeter. Yeah, millimeter. So they use it for for construction design. You know, like uh, aircraft wings, etc. To 
really track this, this stress distribution along these things. So definitely, uh, in in Roma, for example, they they used it for uh, high speed uh, share tests. Um, they, they use it. They use only DTS so far. They have not used the yet uh, strains, and they use it to see uh, what is called flash heating. So along the port, you want they, they want to see changes in temperatures. Oh, yeah, that, that's uh, number yeah, yeah. Great. So I guess we are ready to finish. Okay. Thank you, Eve. Thank you again. So I think we had a really good turnout and thank you for